Hello and welcome to the third and last day of Wacom Career Days, the online event where experienced self-employed artists and studio professionals will share their insight and experiences on how to pursue a professional career as a creative. In the last two days, we have covered a lot of topics about starting or navigating your creative career. Now, before we jump into the presentation, I will remind you some of the housekeeping basics. Our session will last approximately one hour. We will have a dedicated Q&A block at the end where Darek will answer your questions. During the presentation, we will be keeping an eye on the chat, so feel free to send your questions anytime you wish. We are all here to learn from the experiences of our speakers, so please be kind to each other and do not spam the chat. This session is being recorded and will be published on Wacom YouTube page during next week so that you can watch it again. We love the micro community that has formed in the chat, and as a regular reminder, this stream will be on until around 10 p.m. and you will have plenty of opportunity to network in between live sessions. So I kindly ask you to keep the chat clean for questions and comments related to what our speaker is presenting. Well, about who we are, one final reminder. This event is brought to you by Wacom and our sponsor MSI. For those of you who know Wacom, welcome back. And for those who are new, Wacom has been around for some odd 40 years and we are the pioneers of digital pen input technology. Whenever you want to create on your computer and you realize that using a mouse or a trackpad just don't cut it, you should try using a digital pen. You will find it much, much better. As I said, Wacom Career Days is also sponsored by MSI. With more than 35 years of technological expertise and a never-ending drive for innovation, MSI satisfies the needs of all types of end users with product lines that include, but are not limited to notebooks, desktop computers, monitors, components, and chassis. A world leader in content creation, business, and gaming solutions, MSI's newest content creation series products, creator and prestige notebooks, PCs, and monitors are not only powerful enough for even the most demanding creator tasks, but it is also known for its pleasing and award-winning designs. To learn more and discover the right products for you, please visit de.msi.com. Now let's go through to the last advertising. To show our appreciation to all of you who took time to be here with us today, we have an outstanding offer for you. By using the discount code CAREER20 in Wacom Europe and UK eStore, you can get 20% discount on our top products, including the Wacom Cintiq and Cintiq Pro Family lines, the multiple award-winning Wacom Intuos Pro Family, our newest 13-inch pen display, Wacom One, and our exceptional all-in-one pen computer, Wacom Mobile Studio Pro. This is a limited time offer, so you don't want to miss it. And don't forget, the code is CAREER20. Well, finally, it's time to start, and we have Darek as our speaker. Darek is a co-founder and CEO of Europe's first concept art school, Focal Point School. He works with clients such as Netflix, NVIDIA, Sony, Fox, EA, and Blur. And he has contributed to franchises like Maze Runner, Call of Duty, Love, Death, and Robots, Destiny, Assassin's Creed, Death Stranding, and many, many more. Well, I know you're not here to listen to me talking, so I'll stop now. <laughs> And now let's enjoy Derek's presentation. Awesome. Uh, <clears throat> hello, I hope uh, I, you can clearly hear me. Well, uh, thank you very much uh, at the beginning uh, to Wacom for inviting me. Um, it's always a pleasure to, to team up with you guys. Um, yeah, what, I, what can I say about myself? I'm an artist, I'm a concept artist working uh, in, in film and games industry for uh, almost a decade already. Um, as Honor said, I've been doing uh, quite a few uh, projects uh, for well-known franchises, but on the side, actually, I'm rather right now also focusing on expanding my own personal pieces and my own personal collections. And I just, for that today would be really good to talk about this, the stuff that is, is sort of like a treat, like a taboo in our industry, something that's not really uh, that well known for the people, especially for those who are starting out. Like I remember myself when I was starting out, maybe you can share uh, uh, my presentation uh, because right now I feel like um, there is so many information online about how to do stuff, how to you know, uh, how to use specific tool, how to use specific technique, but there is not that much talk about what you should do in order to get into industry or what you should do 
in order to basically make a living out of your art, right? Some, some people can say like, yeah, but it's your passion, it's your hobby. Yes, it is still a hobby and passion, but if you can turn it into, into your life, into your, uh, into your source of income, that's even better, right? So I'm here uh, to talk about this. I prepared like a presentation that in a nutshell uh, just shows those stuff. So uh, of course, after the session, we will have, uh, we will have a quick Q&A panel. So if you guys um, have any questions, because I saw already some questions in the chat that were touching upon uh, business side of things. Um, I hope this presentation will clarify a lot for you. So let's go. Uh, so I basically uh, started as a young kid who always loved to draw. My first inspiration was uh, the Lion King uh, um, a cartoon. Uh, I was introduced to that by my uh, aunt that sent me the, um, the, the tape with, with the um, with that film and I was so shocked like I, of course a lot of children a lot of kids are, are liking to draw and they are very uh, they are very passionate about it in the beginning stages but fortunately I had my mother who basically um, sort of like curated that I'm not gonna stop doing that because she uh, she was an architect and she basically uh, pushed me towards like uh, you should you should do that maybe you know like she didn't want to push it that much or put the pressure on me, but she always gave me like a new sources of inspiration. So my parents were were meeting with with my aunt, and she sent me uh, this tape from back from Germany. Uh, in Poland, we basically had like not that much uh, sources sources of uh, you know of of, of uh, acquiring those uh, those tapes. So it was basically the moment that the, the Lion King was a new thing, and I was. At the time, I was like three, three and a half years old, and I started uh, drawing with animals. I started drawing with uh, Lion King. I started drawing with dinosaurs because also at the time there was a super popular um, a time for like a Jurassic Park that the first one came out. So I, of course, loved drawing that and loved drawing all those sceneries and coming up with the new scenes and basically was so hyped about everything that comes to like, uh, you know, animals and, 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 and sci-fi or fantastic um, uh, sceneries. Uh, but as you can see, and at the beginning, I, I drew very dynamic scenes and sometimes people um, in the family were like uh, talking to my mother, like, oh, you know, this kid maybe have some like uh, problems <laughs> that has to be treated, but, yeah, that, that's the way I was, you know, I, I loved drawing like a, a angry tigers or angry lions or dinosaurs that were like fighting with each other because I felt like this whole like natural uh, spirit of situations in, in, the, in the wild savage life uh, gives me a lot of dynamics for my drawings. And it basically um, escalated to a lot of different topics. I, I then um, was super inspired by history. I love studying like uh, Second World War. I love studying um, uh, the First War. Uh, then I proceeded to uh, to some sci-fi stuff back in 2003 when there was like I had like some of my first computers. Um, so I was basically following up what's uh, what's on the market regarding the games. I wasn't really a hardcore gamer. I'm still not, but I was super hyped by the worlds that people are creating and. Back then, I didn't even know that you can be an artist who make a living out of your out, out of your art. I knew that there are some people who who do that because I saw some documentary on Godzilla movies and the designs that they were doing for uh, for the for the main character. But I thought that yeah, this is a job for like you know five people in the world, right? So so I didn't know back then and in 2003 that something like that happens. So I was just redrawing a lot of existing designs. I was coming up with my own stuff uh, from the games like Quake, Doom, uh, um, and a lot of like stuff that was basically up online and was trendy uh, back then. And in 2007, I basically moved on to uh, from paper and started like drawing on tablet. And since I was always drawing more with pen and pencil, I figured out I don't know, I don't know anything about the colors. And I had so much problems with like painting. So um, 
also worth mentioning is that there were no educational, uh, you know, uh, schools or no educational podcasts, no YouTube back then. It was 2007, so everything was pretty much new. Digi digital art was also very small. Like there were like a group of people who were already uh, professionals and were working in the industry. But regarding the um, um, people like me who were a newbie, who were following and looking up to those people, I didn't know anything about it. I didn't even have like a uh, experience to to get my first job. So I was doing some illustrations in Photoshop. I was trying to learn how to merge colors and what's not. It was a very long process because, uh, as I said, the only the only source of uh, inspiration or uh, tutorials that I could basically um, uh, that I basically learned from were uh, Gnomon uh, workshops. Uh, they were basically. Uh, selling DVD copies of the of their lectures and instructor videos, and I even I couldn't even uh, like I'm basically afford it. So yeah, that there was always the finding the way to 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 take it from somewhere and and watch it online uh, or watch it on my on my uh, on my PC. Uh, so uh, yeah, it was a time that um, I felt like I didn't know where I'm going because I was 2007. I was still like. Pretty young. I was 16 years old. As I said before, I didn't actually plan to to become an art uh, art professional. Um, I might have that feeling that it might it might happen maybe when I'm 40 or 50, but I didn't know that I, I can I can basically make a living um, in that early years. So basically, uh, so basically, I I remember when I was uh, I was almost giving up. Uh, on painting on, on on tablet because I didn't feel like I'm going in the right direction. I was always making circles, and I felt like yeah, this is something that uh, you know I I know how to draw, I know how to sketch, but I I had that something missing in my in my skill set. So also that um, that lackluster of of tools and educational platforms was very very. Uh, visible uh, in my on my end, and at some point when I was in high school, I also I almost like thought about going to IT and giving up on art at all. So I always loved drawing, but uh, but I didn't know that I can make it. So in 2000, I guess 10 or or circa around that time, I was basically having some of the first commissions uh, for my illustrations that were basically um, like card games, board games, like small cover art. The stuff that's basically not super prolific when it comes to like a business side, but I was still like a you know young kid, and every money for me was important that I could basically buy a new tablet. And <laughs> it might sound like a like a promotional ad right now, but I always went with Wacom at the beginning because I had a uh, one tablet um, that wasn't that, there and at the be very beginning that you had to load your pen with uh, with batteries. And I gave up on that after two weeks. So I have to be very honest here. Um, <laughs> I always used uh, Wacom for that. So I always basically invested everything that I earned. I invested in myself. So I wasn't basically spending it on like, oh, I'm going to buy a new game or I'm going to buy uh, some like a cool, fancy, you know, um, trousers or something like that. I was always making sure to save the money from the very beginning and then invest into my PC, into better monitor screens, into better, um, into basically all subscriptions to the softwares that I use. Um, yeah, and best, basically the best possible tablets, right? So that was at the time that I understood that I have to make a living because uh, at our family, there was not that much money. So we were pretty much like a standard family, but not super like, I didn't want to also put too much strain on my parents to basically uh, have all my stuff that I need uh, and buy it for me uh, because I knew it, the situation wasn't that, uh, I think, sweet. And yeah, I basically wanted to, I basically wanted to uh, uh, earn everything by myself and, and help them rather than uh, expect something in return because they were helping me towards that moment when I was in 2000, I think, 13. They were helping me tremendously. Um, I was 22 at the time. In 2013, and I I thought like yeah like they did enough to me like they always 
you know, look for like the ways to find the inspiration for me. They help me like getting the right um, papers, pencils, uh, paints, but I'm in a digital era right now. I'm one of those small kids and I decided I'm going to make uh, it all by myself. So I just wanted to put the pressure off their shoulders, right? So in 2013, I remember I was sending the, my works to, uh, what was it called? Like, I think Infected by Art. There was like, a, there was the book that basically collected the best works uh, of sci-fi and fantasy from all over the world. And I was just sending them some of my stuff. In, in, the, in those times, I already got to know better how to paint because it's worth mentioning as well that I was coming back and forth to paint on the uh, on the uh, paper board with acrylics and this helped me tremendously to understand how to uh, how to paint in Photoshop in a way that I can basically uh, become as efficient and I can show the depth I can show the lighting values and and all those features so in 2013 I made some of uh, my um, best, uh, you know, paintings at the time. And I was sending that to this infected by art group of people. And they were basically, uh, you know, receiving like a thousands of submissions, uh, for this specific year. And I didn't know. Yeah. I'm, I didn't have like any hope that I will be, I will be winning because I saw some of the artists that were submitting their work and they were already professionals that I look up to. So I was like, yeah, I'm just a small guy and like, I'm going to send my stuff, but yeah, this is gonna help. <laughs> like I don't know, and there was like a there was like a voting by people on online. I think uh, it was one of the first actually contests like that, and yeah, I was so shocked because I was uh, my Nazgul painting that that's like basically the fan art of Nazgul from Lord of the Rings. We're getting higher and higher in the in the in the chart in the in the ranking. And I don't know that there were like some, uh, some places above me and like, yeah, I already did enough. I'm already feel like I showed myself, uh, there isn't that much. My, my presence is, is somewhere there and, and for the wider audience, because there were like people from all over the countries and I felt like, yeah, it's, it's fine, but I don't know how finally or happily, uh, a couple of weeks later, I, I found out that my work won in the contest, um, in the voting, uh, run by people uh, online. And I got an email from, from those guys from infected by art. And they invited me to go to States to uh, comic con to present my works. And I was like, I was so shocked because, uh, for, a, for a kid like me, uh, going to States, like I'd never really flew before. Um, I was like, so I, at the beginning I was reluctant to go because like, no, I'm not, you know, I'm happy and I want some. I, I won like a, I think thousand dollars or something in price as well. And I was so happy because it, for me, was like a proper commission back then. Uh, but yeah, like, I didn't know if I want to go because I was afraid of like flying and the planes were scaring me. So, and the first flight was already to stay. It's like, no, no, screw that. So basically, um, I, yeah, I was, in my, I was talking to my parents and it's like, yeah, you should go. So it might be your chance. You should, you should see, you know, be, because like, it might sound like, oh, American dream, but basically everything is there. So at the time that, um, the YouTube and, and everything that surrounding concept art was still pretty new all over the world. And it was of course, definitely the biggest in, in States. I thought that, yeah, it might be a chance. So my parents basically persuade me like, oh, you should go, you should, um, you should definitely try that out. And I, yeah, I asked organizers if they can, yeah, keep me for like a couple of weeks there so I can basically see the world, the different world out there. And, and I flew there. I, I show my work on Comic Con. I basically prepare like a bunch of prints. I remember back then I was also sharing the table on Comic Con with, uh, Peter Morbacher, I guess you guys uh, are familiar with this guy. He was already big, you know, he was already like proper professional. And I was like, a, yeah, just a normal, normal guy from Poland coming with, with a bunch of prints, like no one knew about me. And it's like, yeah, I'm going to show my stuff. I had like a 3000 followers on DeviantArt and I thought that, <laughs> yeah, I felt like it's pretty small, uh, but that that's, that's where it started. And I showed my work. 
I visited Gnomon Workshop because I really wanted to see their school. I visited some um, some studios and and I and I figured out like okay, this is this is the stuff that I want to do. Like I know I have the energy. I'm still young. I have the power. I have um, everything that basically is on my side because I was super motivated. I was super hardworking. But one of the things that I basically mentioned to my keep mentioning to myself, like, I need to work even harder because this industry is so big. Like I saw so many artists on Comic Con, not only the cosplayers, uh, like illustrators, cover artists, concept artists. Um, and it was so big, it was so overwhelming. And it's like, you know, I, I don't feel like I'm there yet, but I really want to be there. So I just came back to Poland and in 2014, 2000, I think whole 2014 was basically working on my portfolio uh, for like a, oriented more towards the concept art. Because as I mentioned before, I until that point, I already had some small commissions that helped me uh, making, a, you know, like a normal life of uh, or basically decent life or invest into 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 my equipment but i knew that it's not there yet i knew it's like i want to be a concert artist i want to come up with ideas and i want to inspire the teams because when i was there i when i was on comic con i met i met some of the concert artists and i remember that yeah this world is pretty much bigger than what i was expecting when i was as in 2007 that I thought that, yeah, it's like probably a couple of people doing that. It was like the armies of people working on designs, but they were so uh, out of social life, basically, like maybe not social life, like social media life, because social media back then was basically Facebook mostly. So I remember I was so hyped. I was so inspired. So the whole 2014, I was basically working my ass off uh to uh to showcase my work online to pre to present my stuff to build my portfolio so it was also the time that uh, art station uh was coming up on the horizon and i was posting my works regularly like every week every couple of days i was coming up with something new like whether it's like environment or keyframe illustration or some design always coming up with something new to feed the people who are visiting the earth that side because i knew already we all knew and we all felt that our station is going to take over is like a becoming like a main uh place uh, for concept artists and illustrators besides of course social medias so i was working my ass off uh to to prepare like the best stuff possible and in, by the end of 2000 14 i already started to getting like the first uh messages first emails from the clients that were basically uh um like a proper uh studio you know proper proper studios like sony frame store uh, ilm and uh, all of those were in contact with with me at, at the point at that point and i remember that um the sony was the fastest so i went uh, i flew to uk working for Sony Gorilla Games on their uh, on their uh, new VR game at the time. And yeah, it was like where the whole world basically opened again for me because I I realized that I'm so I'm so out of the loop because I didn't know what uh, what's the reality of working in the industry, what's the reality working in the studio. So I basically uh, found out that I don't know I know nothing, you know. I know I know how to draw, I know how to paint. But I, don't, I know nothing about the proper uh, AAA production, you know. So working on illustrators, illustrations for cardboard games or cover art is was totally different to me than working on like a full blown out project for PS4. I think PS4 at the time, um, and learning all the techniques, all the all the work workflows, and basically methodology behind behind the scenes and how the huge uh, production comes to life so uh, the beginnings were very harsh like i remember i was i was almost like a crying because i didn't know like i was so lost but with after time after time i become more and more uh flexible with the tasks that i was given i started learning like a new tools like 3d i was talking to a lot of other guys that were like uh, 3d modelers animators that were helping me understand the crucial things behind the scenes for for such production and by the end of the my by the end of my contract uh, almost in because i was on one year contract in 2000 almost in 2015 i was contacted 
Um, I was contacted uh, by Ubisoft. Um, I was actually contacted by Ubisoft before going to Sony, but uh, all the process and interviews uh, were somehow uh, put on hold because one of the main guy, uh, our director, was actually on vacation and the whole the whole topic of me working for them was basically put on hold and i thought that yeah, they had they they didn't like me or something because i also uh, were doing some artists for them but i was so hyped because it was like i knew it's gonna be for the next assassin's creed and i was such a big assassin's creed fan uh, at the time but yeah i just focused on the work at sony and a couple of weeks after i was in sony at the sony uh, i got an email from this art director from ubisoft like hey Derek." uh do you want to work with us uh, on Assassin's Creed? Like, come over to uh, Singapore. That was the Singapore studio at the time. Uh, and I was like, yeah, but I'm already at uh, the other studio, so I cannot really, uh, you know, go there, like leaving the, the contract or just ending it just like that. So they offered me to work uh, offsite and like uh, all, uh, remotely uh, uh, after hours. So I basically were doing I was basically pulling uh, two projects at the same time. So yeah, one one project is like from nine to six being in a the studio, then coming to my apartment and working uh, on Assassin's Creed. So this was basically like, a, yeah, like a dream, uh, a dream come true uh, to me, but it was so, uh, so much hustle. You know, I was still young. I feel like my body can, can handle that but I was really devastating my body, you know, like I, I wasn't sleeping at all. I remember one, one times um, I basically came back uh, on Friday uh, evening after my studio work. I didn't want to work anymore uh, on, on the other project uh, that day. So I just lay down on the bed with all my stuff on because it was like a, I think it was a winter uh, or like um, late winter time. And I just fall asleep and I felt uh, I, and I, and I was sleeping till like the next day, like two or 3 PM. And when I, when I, uh, when I woke up, I saw that there were like a hundred, hundred something called unanswered or uh, yeah, unanswered calls. And at the time my girlfriend was scared because uh, she was living in Poland and she thought that I'm, I'm, I'm dead or <laughs> some, someone kidnapped me or, or whatever. So there were crazy times, but I, cannot really uh, I cannot really uh, regret that because um, this all hustle paid off I finished the contract at Sony I was still continuing work on Assassin's Creed I coming back I was uh, I was back to Poland in in late 2015 and I decided yeah I have like uh, already some new jobs coming I remember the guys from Framesor uh, also were waiting for me with like a, some 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 commissions. And yeah, the only way for me was to start a company and yeah, just to do commissions from my home. And that's that's how it started, you know? So I basically uh, figured out that, that I wanna basically run a small company on my own and basically uh, come up with ideas and generate ideas on or solve like visual problems to the studios around the world. But I don't really wanna travel anymore because there were already some studios that were wanting me very uh very badly to come over to different country and travel like uh countries to to work on site but i was like no nah, i'm i'm fine you know i'm i'm done with that for now so yeah i always had this feeling that uh, it might be also personal thing but i felt like i really wanted to be uh independent you know so to speak i love i love working with team i love being social with people those who know me can probably know that, uh, that I'm a very enthusiastic person. But for work, I like to be independent. I like to work on my own stuff. I like to work on uh, with my own uh, with my own tempo and pace. Even though I'm, I'm rather fast, I like to be just on my own, you know, sitting um, in front of the in front of the screen and not caring about if I if I have like a proper smart shirt or not. So rather it's, it's a personal choice and I was lucky enough to basically, yeah, be able to do that for all my career, uh, until today, until this day, uh, and I'm still providing designs and illustrations all over the world. Yeah. Without really moving. Sometimes I'm consulting the things on site, but of course we have very, very crazy and bad times with all the pandemics. So yeah all the studios or most of the studios anyway, changed to, to working uh, uh, from home, which is 
which is made which might be a good thing for freelancers so um yeah i talk too much but uh i basically in in this slide you can see that i picked up like a one by one the pieces that were somehow the benchmark for my skills at the time so yeah of course remember the previous uh, previous slides where i was a kid in 2013 i finally managed to to paint something that uh, people uh, can associate themselves with and they like it um, in 2016 um I, when i was already a professional working in the industry i already was doing a couple of personal pieces and yeah i think always the personal pieces for me were the were were those like uh, punching points were those like key arts that were basically uh showcasing my current stage of skill and in 2020 of course the windmill town uh, yeah the work that i didn't even plan but became like a a yeah, very big hit and and yeah a lot of track traffic it generated a lot of traffic and interest in my art so um it also shows me and i will be talking about it as well in the next slides it is very important to have your uh your best pieces and it usually happens that your personal pieces are the best uh, because you can actually spend the most time on that you don't have like any deadline on that um, but of course, I, ro I love also working on the professional stuff. And I feel um, until like between 2016 and 2020, actually, I, I thought that most of my best works were basically for the clients. So I changed it in 2020 and I hopefully will do the same in 2021 because I already have a couple pieces started. But yeah, there is always so much work, and the, there is only one uh, one day uh, during the during the day. There is only two, 24 hours. Uh, so yeah, uh, let's move on to um, uh, to the next slides because I think this is uh, pretty important. So um, since we are in portfolio day today, and I'm talking business. I will be talking business, but I also want to mention how important it is to make a portfolio that basically uh, draws attention of people, like bring you a new audience and bring you new potential clients. So this is a screen from my ArtStation page, and I just basically uh, scale down the whole uh, browser to see, you know, how my works are basically, yeah, how, how do they look uh, if someone is basically looking at my works for the first time or if they are looking or searching for something specific. Um, so yeah, a lot of things are going on. A lot of things are uh, basically attached upon like, um, you know, designs, environments, um, max, uh, illustrations, key arts, uh, props and what's not. And this basically was speaks for my uh, for my portfolio. It doesn't mean that someone who wants to go into concept art field has to do that. But I also prepared the other graph that I'm going to show in a second that shows the importance of being versatile, right? So uh, take a glimpse the, the glimpse of of my work and look at this graph. So as a concept artist or illustrator or what's not you can basically have um you can be specialist on one thing you can be specialized in in one specific genre or subject or design purposes or you can basically juggle with things and be able to provide more so i was on the latter i was on the other side even though uh, i will be talking about how important it is to have your strongest points I was always on the other side because I was so um, I was so inspired. I was so hyped about the world that I didn't really want to do just one thing, you know. And you can tell also by my personal pieces, you know. Sometimes it's fantasy, sometimes it's sci-fi, sometimes it's like a, not connected to the other work. Sometimes I do collections, like a like a series of people of of, of works, but yeah rarely you know it, it most of the time it's like i'm jumping on the subjects because i'm that kind of the person you know i don't really like to be focused only on one thing and for some people it might be a, a drawback some so for some people it might be like a negative but for me it's a very positive because the more i can juggle the more i'm able to provide to my clients so sometimes i can work on characters sometimes i can work on vehicles 
And most of the time, or sometimes I can work on something that people know me uh, the best from, which is environments or wall building. So um, this graph shows that it, it, I'm calling it equal because this might be like a one specialist who does, I don't know, like let's say, um, yeah, we can go to this graph, to, who does like character design and he is the best in the world or maybe like top 20 in the world, right? And he got paid for that. He got like loads and loads of commissions or loads of projects that he works on. And the other things like environment or vehicle or props, he is like, yeah, it doesn't mean that he is bad at it, but he doesn't really touch upon that, right? So this is also um, to show you that there is like a profile of each concept art, like one concept art is more versatile, one is more specialized. And I don't feel, Sorry, I don't think that um, being a specialized is a bad thing. That's why I prepare like two graphs and how I see that is like, um, I also feel I'm a little bit more specialized in one thing than the other, but the more variety is in your portfolio, the bigger are the chances that you get, yeah, hired on different projects. Sometimes you are hired on for something that you don't expect yourself to be, but the art director or producer, uh, has the eye and can tell like, oh, this person can also, I guess this person can also handle this. So mm, this is one of the profile, being specialized in one thing. The other profile is like, a, I call it one man, one man army. And I also put into, uh, into the graph uh, a quote, healthy approach. Why do I feel it's a healthy approach? Because at the beginning, when I was preparing those graphs, I had all the bars even and it's like, yeah, it's good, you know, because you can be one man army and you provide things that are, yeah, either good or very good on all different levels. Although it's not possible to be the best in everything, like no freaking way. You can be the best in only one thing or two things, but you cannot be the best in everything. So I had these graphs and they were all even and, and equal. And it's like, yeah, but this doesn't really speak for myself. I feel like all those things I can handle maybe sometimes worse, sometimes better, but I know that there is always one thing. We call it in Poland, um, uh, Twój konik, uh, which means like, it's like your horse, that's something that basically you do the best from your skill set. And for myself, uh, I know it's an environment design and world building. So I just put the bar a little bit higher, even though I always, no matter what I do, I always try to provide the best possible quality for my clients. But I know that environments are the thing. And I know the environments will basically elevate the project and help uh, and help the team or help the project to, uh, to, to have something extra. And I also want to add something extra out of myself because that's what people uh, know me the most from, from doing environments, from doing world building. For you, it might be character design. It might be vehicle design. I know a lot of artists that are amazing character designers or are amazing at vehicle designs and all of those things they have the graph similar to me you know like they have all the bars on a very equal level but for instance vehicle designs is is above that is like making it something that they are so attractive to the client on the market and that's why they are being hired on the other thing i on the other uh, yeah on the other thing um I really uh, do believe it's really important to have your trademark pieces, right? So something that I was showing you before when it comes to like my benchmark pieces, right now I'm always taking care of like each year I'm creating at least one or two pieces that basically show my current stage of my skill set. And I I know it's hard to say because it's it's not something that you can predict, but I always try to do better work than before uh, without really putting the pressure on myself, because for instance, with Windmill Town, I didn't plan to be that good. You know, I didn't. I knew it's gonna be some nice picture, but I didn't plan to be my most, you know, well-known or best work that I ever done. In some cases, or in some in some features, it might not be the best work still. You know, but uh, in general, the storytelling and everything, it just it just clicked. But it doesn't mean that, uh, that every next work will be better because if I put the pressure on myself in that way, it's not gonna work, you know? I have also work that I did uh, afterwards, like Vault 
And it's, I feel like, yeah, it's pretty good work, but I don't feel, or I don't think it's better than this one. So I all, I treat them all as a trademark of what I'm at or where I'm at at the moment. So it's good to have them because the clients um, want to see the portfolio that is very strong with the your best pieces, basically. So um, if you go back to some of the slides before, you can tell, oh yeah, Derek, but you have like uh, hundreds of pieces in your portfolio. Yes, and I agree. Some of those, uh, like in the third or fourth row, already are much worse than what I would do today. But um, I'm not building the portfolio uh, to uh, to basically attract new clients. Like maybe not not maybe put it this different way. I'm not building the portfolio from scratch. So I'm keeping it all as a history. You know, if you go down below on my art station, you can see the oldest work. If you go down, if you go up, all the stuff in the first row or two rows are the most up to date. So if I had to give a suggestion to those who are starting out and want to prepare the portfolio, basically speak uh, and basically make it more as a portfolio of best trademarked pieces. Like, uh, I have a collection of like five, six pieces that I feel like they are good. They are quite good uh, and might be the best in my collection, but maybe it's not something suitable for others. Maybe some, someone tell like, yeah, but I prefer your work from six, six, six or seven years ago. And it's normal because sometimes it's like a, it's like a design, it's like a story, it's the lighting, it's a value, it's like a, it's composition, something that's much, be much, that, that might be much better than what you do. Uh, or what you've done, uh, um, you know, uh, this year, for instance. So uh, always good to have like the best pieces up online, but also make sure if you create like a project for your portfolio and you show different stuff, like uh, like this one, for instance. If I had to, yeah, if I had to do like my portfolio and if I had to pick up five words, uh, I actually pick up five slides for those trademark works. And if I had to do, for instance, the post with this work, I would basically post also a lot of my sketches, a lot of my se uh, separate designs. So basically you showcase to your client that you can actually think that you actually have, um, um, you know, problem solving uh, in attitude, right? That you actually uh, generate ideas for your final designs. Something that, um, yeah, we don't really show uh, anymore when we post just final works, but something that's super important when people don't know you yet and you wanna basically become attractive to them. You wanna be attractive on the market for the new client. You have to show that you have ideas. You have to show that you can generate ideas. You can generate fast sketches. You can basically come up with a new ideas, new designs, new compositions, whatnot. Because if you post only illustrations, that's good, but it might only end up that you put yourself into the back of doing just one specific job, right? So uh, that's uh, what I really uh, put the huge impact on. And I also uh, tell my students uh, at the school that they really need to show that they generate ideas. Not Don't always look up the artists that are on art station and they post basically the finished works. Yeah, I'm one of the guilty ones as well, but basically show that you have something more to, sh to show or you can you have something more to speak for than just uh, final pieces because yeah with those final pieces um the clients the art director they know who should they hire or they know uh, that those guys that are on the top and posting only final pieces they can generate also ideas the clients know it already but you as an basically starting up person or newbie or or basically the someone who is like going to enter the industry as I was I was pretty much like yeah I didn't know I didn't know shit about anything at the beginning as I told you in the previous slides but it all came with the experience and I remember that um, someone told me once like you have you have great illustrations but you have to also show that you have to show that you are able to design you have to show your sketches you have to show your ideas so i wasn't really afraid of like showing my dirty sketches or like quick speed paintings because i really wanted to basically um you know uh show something extra that basically was very uh was very uh, concept or design oriented 
yeah, some other pieces that you can see uh, in my collection that I picked up. And yeah, that's about it for this uh, portfolio. Uh, for, 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 sorry, <laughs> portfolio part. I'm going to take a sip of water because I have also the business uh, side of things prepared, which is also very important. And I would love you guys to uh, to put in the comments um, uh, when we are ending this chapter, um, if you look at this graph or this graph, or even this one, if you can put into the chat, um, what person do you think you are? You are the one specific project person or you are the one who is one man army? Just post it to the chat. I will be happy to later on read all the comments. Um, so ending this chapter, we are heading towards the money, right? It's something that's, uh, as I mentioned before in the very beginning, it might be treated a little bit like a taboo. I don't even know why, because I feel uh, the less people are educated on this topic, uh, the worse impact it has on our market, right? I feel like when I was starting out and I didn't know I didn't know anything about the salaries or money that you can make. I was basically, yeah, just just doing the illustrations for uh, for the card games, and I was happy that someone paid me like a hundred dollars because in Poland it was like almost four times that amount. And uh, after conversion, and I could basically buy almost uh, maybe not the tablet, but I could, yeah, for two or three illustrations I could buy a tablet. So I was like. I was like living in a dream, like, yeah, I'm so, you know, like I already can make a living because as I said, like, um, we weren't really uh, a rich family. So uh, in terms of money, because of the emotions, it was always opposite. But um, yeah, I felt like this is something that I'm still not educated enough. And someone told me that, yeah, maybe it's not, it's not it's not the amount that you should you should you should charge. You know, maybe you should charge more. And I was like, and I was asking questions. Like one of the things that I'm always um, um, I'm always confused. I'm always like, maybe not frustrated, but I'm always like, uh, how to say that? I'm uh, I'm rather the person that encourage someone or my students or someone who uh, send me the messages. Um, to be uh, to be more uh, brave with asking questions. If we didn't ask questions, how we are basically able to um, to know or estimate uh, our incomes? Or it's not even about the money. It's like if I didn't ask Google about specific things, I didn't know how to find some option in Photoshop. Right? It's that it's that simple. It's like I basically had a lot of talks with artists that were uh, that were uh, much uh, better and much um, more professional than me at the time when I was running uh, with with my folks uh, Level Up uh, podcast on YouTube, and then I remember we had a lot of talks with those artists before the sessions or after the sessions and. Even when I didn't have all the questions answered, I just basically reach out to them and, and ask them for help. Like, yeah, can you just tell me a little bit more about the business side of thing? Because there is not that much online, as I told you. And we are in 2021 and there is still not that much on the business side of things in art uh, when it comes to uh, basically uh, growing your own business as an artist. Because as you probably uh, know, uh, it's very hard to monetize your work, right? It's very hard at the beginning to monetize your work. So, um, of course, after a time, after a while, with the all experience and with all different studios that I worked on and with all different experiences that I had in my life, because some experiences actually affected how I treat my business side of things, right? I love making art. I'm super passionate. I'm the person that lives by art every day. But when it comes to work, I'm just doing my best job and I treat, it, treat my clients fairly. I'm treating them the, in the best possible way, but I know it's a business. I know they want the best stuff and I want the best money, right? So this is something that um, you are learning and you are growing that uh, with time. And I had to grow my thick skin because I remember like I was, yeah, I was basically 
maybe not ripped off, but I was used on on quite a few occasions that uh, I I wasn't really uh, aware of the money that you can get, and I felt I felt like yeah, those people are making huge amount of money out of out of your designs, and you are just making a uh, yeah something that lets you. I don't know, like a buy a new T-shirt or something, right? So this is like a that sort of like a um, uh, that sort of uh, comparison. But you have to make sure you have to understand that um, you know when you provide the designs to a huge project, to triple A project, to multi million movie, you are the one who generates idea. You are the one who solves the design issues, who solves the visual problems, and you are the one who basically. Um, inspires the whole teams the whole team of people the whole uh production team the uh the modelers the vfx artists and what's not so i'm not saying that our job is better than others but i'm saying that you have to value yourself from the very beginning because i know a lot of my students uh when we talk at school um they they tell me that um, they charge this or that for the illustration or for the concept and it's like at their level, even when they are entry level, it's still not enough. You know, like it's it's used. It's basically using people. It's using people for for uh, for their advantage. And I'm always saying that you should value yourself from the beginning because it will not only help your brand, you, you, because you as an artist become a brand, but also it helps the industry to keep the certain level um of uh, certain yeah level of uh, of uh, of uh, of rates in the industry um because yeah sometimes the studios that i worked with um five six years ago they reach out to me and they offer me less money that i was charging like six years ago which is crazy because of course um you have a certain point that you can reach with your rates but basically it's like for the clients it's it's a it's the more you can negotiate the, the and they they are uh they are um able to pay the more you are able to basically raise the raise the rates so it's crazy that so many studios are uh becoming more and more uh, used to like uh, cheap assets and i would love to everyone to take it um into consideration when you are starting out of course we have to prove ourselves on many levels but you have to make sure that you at least make a living out of that right if you are entering this as a job right so uh, this is a graph that shows uh salaries in video games um of course yearly incomes yearly e earnings uh it shows at different positions uh, from junior concept artists is between 40 to 60 thousand dollars uh, for concept artists who is already experienced is seventy to ninety thousand dollars. For senior concept artists, uh, is uh, hundred thousand and everything above that. You reach certain points, but please take it with a grain of salt. That is basically is very flexible, right? So I don't want you to feel going below this because um, for each step, but make sure that um, that that top part, the top bar. Is always very flexible, and sometimes you can take 140. One, sometimes you can you can take 145, and and what's not. So this is for senior concept artists in in the in the video games, and for art director is 150 and everything above. You know, I know people. I I've been uh, on the project that uh, that as an as a art director you can earn even much more than 250 thousand uh, dollars. So this is for the video games and. I'm giving this graph as a yearly incomes uh, because for the movie, uh, at least in my experience, it's, it's a different thing. In movies, you work basically um, on a project. And even when you are on site in the studio helping designing the movie, you are basically working on um, um, basically calculated uh by the days, by the amount of days you are spending uh, on the design. So um, I'm most of the time providing designs for movies on the freelance base. Of course, as I mentioned before, sometimes I have to travel, I have to be on the on the on the site and consult on some things. But most of the time you are basically uh, charging the client 
by number of days you spend on it. You can you can you can basically set up the uh, daily rate as I'm giving you right now here, or you can also charge by by weekly because the project for movie usually yeah takes couple weeks or cup. I don't know like. I was on the Mouse Guard movie, which basically lasted a year uh, of the production, but it was a movie that basically was made uh, in a similar way as a game when you build a whole world from scratch. But if you are basically hired to work on uh, the next installment of very famous IP, or you are basically, uh, we have specific movie and we, we need like this and this location, you work, couple of weeks, sometimes two, three months maximum on per uh, per project because the turnaround in movies is much faster. That's why we charge daily or weekly. So we can basically calculate all of those rates um, and times five to have like a weekly rates. But um, as a concept artist who is in the film industry, I don't really see much junior artists working for films. Uh, rather junior positions are uh, secured in game uh, projects. Also, there is much more games um, uh, being created with uh, with like a, uh, that, that, that the long, uh, that the length of the production is of course much longer than one year. So uh, for the concept artists and studio movies, uh, movie studios basically, or directors hire people who are already decent concept artists, so to speak. So I think, uh, you shouldn't go below four fifty uh, um, uh, dollars. Actually, I have uh, small mistakes. It's not a thousand here, so please uh, erase that part. It's a four fifty uh, dollars per day minimum for concept artists who is working on movie. For the regular concept artists, maximum like around seven hundred, seven fifty sometimes. For senior concept artists, eight hundred to twelve hundred dollars, uh, and for art director and production designer or con uh, design consultant is um, from fifteen hundred to yeah to whatever you know. Like uh, there are projects that you can earn like more than two and a half thousand for sure. I can tell that from the experience. So of course, please uh, remember that those are daily rates in in dollars, no thousands. Sorry, I just forgot to erase that part. Uh, make sure to note it down and let's go to the other graph, which basically is a contradiction to what the artists stand for from the beginning, because I was, wasn't, uh, a businessman when I was starting out art, of course, as I told you before, I didn't even know that I'm going to monetize my work. I didn't even know that I'm going to be able to work, uh, in the professional industry. So. This uh, basically is uh, the meaning behind it is that a lot of artists, a lot of artists are insecure. A lot of artists a lack of the experience or lack of the knowledge of how to value yourself, how to value your work. That's why I also decided to prepare this talk for today's uh, portfolio day, because you could see a bit of portfolio stuff, and now you can see the features of characteristic that, that are important to become um, a salesman, businessman, whatever you want to call it. Like the art is basically who can make a living out, out of their life. And there are certain skills that are required, and this, those are the skills that I always stand for. Uh, so of course, hardworking is one of the most important, uh, motivated, uh, inspiring, problem solver. So this is something that I told you before when it comes to like, um, what genre of, for instance, concept design you are heading towards, if you are going to design or problem solve only, uh, things in, or issues with characters or environments, or you want to build a whole world, you are the problem solver because why the directors, why the art directors, why producers are coming up to you as an artist, why do they want to hire you? Because there is some idea, there is something going on for the project, but they need someone who pull the strings, someone who put it into visual language, who basically create the design, who basically create the vision. So this is a problem solving. And this is one of the most important aspects, one of the most important characteristics that you have to have as an artist 
who is a businessman, right? You, of course, have to be communicative. I remember my beginnings were terrible. You know, like I was uh, shy. I didn't know how to speak English. I didn't know how to communicate with people in the studio. So I had to learn everything, I would say, like on the battlefield. Because when I was when I went to Sony, I didn't even know how to speak properly in English, right? I was put into the deep water. And that's maybe why these days I don't care, you know, like I don't care if I make, uh, um, I'm still learning like my, my communicative skills, but I don't care about um, things that put me in a stress before. Oh, like if I, if I for instance, uh, uh, said that world right in, in, in with English accent or something, you know, those little things that basically put so much strain on me back in the day, you don't care anymore. Like you are the one who, who wants to provide designs, who is, who is like, a, um, and who are, uh, communicative to your clients, uh, with visuals, but also uh, verbal, it, it basically grows with time and it grows on me all the time. You know, like I've been traveling the world and I'm still learning. Like you, you never gonna be like, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm the boss, you know, I'm the best, you know, like never gonna be that because this way you become, you became stagnant and you become the, the, the person that, that will never develop any skill. Like I'm not, I don't mean even the visual skills, but also like the communication skills or being the better person. All those things have to be gradually uh, worked on. And I believe that only by the practice you can make uh, progress, right? So uh, I have also very important, um, a very important feature here, always hungry. Like I'm always hungry for being better artist, being a better designer, being a better illustrator, being a better craftsmanship, being a better spokesman, you know, being the better uh, at communication skills, right? So all those things that are pushing me towards becoming a better artist, because I could say like, yeah, okay, I'm in the industry already. I'm professional. People are uh, coming uh, and uh, hire me for their uh, projects. They want my designs. But if you don't develop uh, certain skills or you don't keep develop, you are not, uh, you're not developing them in the, in the farther distance, you become burned out very quickly. And I had those moments already. Like I work on like, uh, Assassin's Creed in the beginning of my career in 2015. And it's like, yeah, it's a breakthrough. You know, I made it, you know, and I felt for, for a while, I felt like, you know, I'm, I'm there. But no, you always have to prove yourself with every, every one and every each uh, project. You have to keep proving your value. And when you beat up your prices, when you beat up your rates, you have to keep on proving that because clients will see, you know, clients will definitely feel if you are uh, lazy with the task or if you are doing it below your certain level. And you will grow certain skills that you will know at the time that you screw that up, even though your clients will not tell you that, but you are able to tell if the clients are coming back to you or not, because the happy client always comes back, always come back. And even when you beat up the rates, they always comes back because they know what they can expect from you as an artist, right? So a lot of other uh, features, of course, open-minded, friendly, clever, uh, creative, of course, a trendsetter is one of the things that um, become very important when you are running a studio or when you are running the school or when you are running your business and associate that business with people who are helping you. So you have to be trendsetter. You have to be also a true leader. So those are the things that you grow with time. You cannot be, I know some people who are naturally leaders, but if they are not proving that in the industry, they won't be leaders because in this industry, in such competitive industry, you have to constantly prove your skills um, in order to reach a certain level, right? So uh, very focused, responsible. Of course, all those things are important. You have to be responsible, for instance, for the deadlines, because if you screw up the deadlines, the whole production is delayed and you are not only losing the faith or, uh, yeah, the faith of your client, but also they are losing the money because of the delays. And there is another person that's going to take over your stuff in the, in the chain, 
uh, of work always. So you have to make sure that you have to treat this work um, with the highest responsibility as you can get, right? Also being very focused, uh, certain of your skills, of course, but not being an asshole, not being like, oh, I'm the best, you know, like, oh, I did this or that. No, never, because clients don't want, don't, don't like working with, uh, with people like that. Or if you are basically building or collecting a team of people who's going to help you, um, no one's, no one likes to work with assholes, right? So this is very important thing, being certain of your skills, but being uh, polite, of course, if you have to be, um, um, how to say that? Like, if you have to be the leader, you have to show those uh, strengths. You have to show those, uh, those features, but it doesn't mean that you have to be, uh, uh bad or you have to treat people badly. Right. So these are like a a few things you can also add many more to this graph you can add um, those that comes to your mind uh, but please note it down as this is uh, uh, these are the things that are really important and also uh, moving on to one of the latest chapter um, is a quick graph showcasing the ways of monetize your art and this is basically based on my experience uh, this graph changes. I have to be honest, this graph changes year by year. Sometimes there's like much more, uh, commercial work. Sometimes you have a new ideas with the side businesses and, and, and you, you basically want to incorporate them. So for me, this graph changes like between 2016 or 2000 and 2021, it's changed a lot, you know, like right now, uh, I would say 50, 60% of my income comes from a professional work. So people are coming all, like coming, um, after my skills, they are basically, uh, they, they want to, uh, they want to pay for my, uh, expertise. Uh, so they hire me for specific project. This is, this is that sort of income, right? Or I'm basically providing some designs, uh, to the projects that are, um, that are in a need or you have to pitch something very quickly or you have to um, build the whole world and it takes like a couple months. So this is the stuff that brings um, the most income uh, for my company, for myself. 20% uh, of, of my um, income comes from the school, Focal Point School that I co-founded with my uh, friend, Mikkel Kuss. Uh, was, uh, as Honor said in the beginning of the session, was one of, actually was the first European school for concept artists. Uh, and we are basically got hit very hard, very badly by COVID, of course, but we always try to keep uh, the income on a decent level. So um, we don't really plan on going uh, online with the school. So we always try to squeeze in the term when their restrictions are lower and people from, from different countries can actually cross the borders. Um, I really hope the pandemic will be over soon and, and the percentage of the income from the school will finally grow um, and will be closer to my commercial or professional work, right? Because I treat that as a side business right now, but this is, st this is still one of the most um, important business for me because um, I teach there and we put a lot of effort, we put a lot of love and we want basically artists to grow. We want artists to become a professionals in the field, in the industry. That's why we do our best work. And of course, with those times of the pandemics, it's sort of, it's sort of like uh, made our plans a little bit, uh, um, it destroyed our plans basically, so to speak. Uh, but yeah, this certain level is a, uh, is a minimum that I try to keep when it comes to incomes from the school. 15% uh, of my income right now comes from merchandise, uh, merchandise in my case, in mostly prints. So I sell the prints, uh, from last year, um, when, when the first wave of COVID hit in Poland, um, we figure out with my wife that we should do something with the stuff that I have already done. And a lot of people were basically reaching out to me after my, uh, Twitter, um, uh, sort of exploded because of windmill town, if I sell the prints and I was always like, yeah, like I was preparing some prints once, once in a while. But I noticed there's like more and more and more people coming and they want to buy the print with my hand signature. So we decided, yeah, let's try it as a new business. And we started like uh, 
sending um, um, like um, uh, prints via uh, email request at the beginning. Then I set up the um, dedicated email for the prints. And eventually, uh, a month or one and a half months ago, I set up the proper shop. I, I set up the proper store for the prints. And now everything, like with replying to people, it's all automatic because all the questions are answered through the store. Uh, which is uh, very cool. And it also shows that um, your business has to also grow when it comes to quality. And I will be also talking about it in the next slide. And the five percentage might come from the royalties or NFTs that are very, very, uh, very um, trendy these days. Uh, but there are always basically the ways that you can monetize it uh, through other things. Uh, uh, like um, I'm also planning on selling um, more um, signed uh, Magic the Gathering uh, cards because I have a lot of cards that I've done in the past and I have a lot of cards that the uh, guys from Wizard sent me, but it might be also up on uh, on my print store very soon. Anyway, this is how I feel it. I also, again, want to uh, take notes and make sure um, to see how you can see the graph for your expertise, right? So for some people, I'm pretty sure 80% might be just professional work or some for some people, merchandise might be, might be much bigger, right? It all um, becomes um, flexible and it all changes accordingly when your brand basically uh, grows. So basically when I was uh, starting selling my prints, it went from one or two percent to fifteen percent. So maybe next year it will be even even better. So that's what I hope. Um, so these are the ways to monetize your work. And what I was telling before, curating each business is one of the most crucial things. And this is the example of my print store when I basically was selling the prints by the email only in the beginning, and people were reach outing, were reach out, uh, were reaching out to me. Sorry. And they were like, uh, I had to reply with my wife to all certain emails, with all the offer, with everything. And until some point, it was it was okay because we had like a, a few uh, orders per week. But when it became like more and more, uh, um, it, it, it became like more uh, like a business, like a small side business. It's like yeah, we have to uh, we have to make things much more automat automatic. And I set up the store, and now everyone can answer basic question for themselves because they see the prices, the material that we use. There is also about section and and what's not. And also, if you have a like, custom question, you can still reach out uh, reach out to me. So this is one of the things that when you basically elevate the quality of uh, of your business, so you basically create a dedicated website. I had also a dedicated email before, but you also maybe create a dedicated newsletter. You have to also link up your business to your social media so people are actually uh, are aware that something like that exists because um, I still got a lot of questions like, oh, if I'm selling my works on Twitter, but I already tried to promote my print store. Maybe not enough still, but if you type Darek Zabrowski prints, it's already the, the store is, is up in the search. So this is very important that you are promoting your business uh, across your social uh, social media, or as I said, through, uh, through your uh, social channels. Mm, what's coming next is of course, quality control. If you set up the new business, I'm not setting it up just for making money, right? I don't want to set up the school to make money. As you could see, even the income is 20%. Sometimes it's lower, sometimes it's better, sometimes it's bigger. It doesn't mean that I created it just for, you know, for money because I want to put the effort. I want to put the quality over quantity and I know the business will grow. The money will come naturally. You don't really want to force it. So that's why quality control is always important. If I, as a brand, if I, as a studio provide a certain design to my clients and I hire like five different people, I need to make sure the quality control is, is as best as possible because clients come for direct, not for someone else who helps you on the project. Right? So this is a very important thing. Making sure your business speaks for what you stand for as a brand is very important, is very important thing because I don't really 
try to uh, div- diversify my income and doing something that's not related to what I do. People know my work, I'm gonna use it. People, uh, I love doing uh, art. I also want business to be art related. So these are the very important things. I'm not basically randomly starting selling ice creams, right? I'm basically making sure that everything that I do is connected with my with my main brand uh, because I want to keep myself being enthusiastic and I want to keep myself being hyped about whatever whatever I do. Uh, regular updates is also being active with uh, and in a good interaction with the fans or the followers is very important to me. So once in a while, I do also uh, stuff like um, giveaway contests. And last time I teamed up with Wacom and we still uh, are in the process of is, uh, sending the prizes to the winners. And this is very important to me because it will always also grow your brand. It will also show that you are uh, you are professional and you are uh, serious when when it comes to partnership with such uh, amazing companies like Wacom. Uh, up to date with current tech and methods, of course, it's very obvious. If I, as my brand, so my studio, Darek Zabrowski, provide a new designs and clients send me three D scene, I'm not telling them like, yeah, but I don't know how to use three D. You know, you have to be up to date with the tech. You have to be up to date with the technology and the workflows because there are certain um, uh, uh, projects that require different skills and you have to always develop those skills on the side. So I'm learning after hours a lot about the new techniques. I'm learning um, uh, new tools because I want to be as attractive, as I said before, as attractive to my clients. Even when I'm already in the game, it's not hard to break into the game. It's not hard to, it's hard, but it's not that hard to break into in the, in the industry as much it's hard to stay and being relevant. So being relevant is one of the most important things because you have to level up your skills. You have to level up your, uh, your quality because there is always someone younger. There is always someone better who is going to replace you eventually. So this is very tough, but uh, yeah, I'm not 20 years old anymore and I already feel it. So one important uh, also uh, thing to note is always thinking ahead of time. So you are predicting what's going to be trendy, what's going to be useful in the production pipeline or what's going to be the next way of uh, propagating or promoting your art. Um, if all of above is a top quality, I always call it 10 out of 10. You have to keep repeating that because as I said before, maintaining your brand uh, credibility, maintaining your, um, uh, your brand um, attractiveness is because it's very important and failures and mistakes of course happen. It happened to me many times and I'm not going to hide it, you know, but you have to acknowledge that you have to make corrections and of course, uh, incorporate uh, your best next time. But of course it's best if you don't make that much mistakes. So uh, I think this is it. Um, I think this was the last slide. So Hope you guys found it um, interesting and it helped some of you answer your questions. Now I'm open to your questions, so let's do a Q&A. Uh, once again, thank you for watching and yeah, waiting for your questions. Wow, that was great, Tarek. I mean, the, the amount of love and appreciation that is right now flowing through the chat is immense and 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 we are really um, thankful and humble that that you have been so transparent and and very open about about the approach about the business side of the things about the numbers so uh really a, a big thank you on behalf of the audience uh from me to you and also thank you for uh, yeah for having me <laughs> yeah go ahead <laughs> now i can see so, my water <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, go ahead. Uh, I will just take a quick look at the questions. We have plenty. Let's see where to start. 
Um, okay, I will start from the beginning and kind of catch up with 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 where you close uh, mm -hmm. the, the your 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 presentation. So um, and also about your question when you ask the audience if they are specialists or one person army, um, the majority see themselves as the one person army. But we also had a couple of people who said that currently. Um, they, they, they feel like they are specialists. They are focused on one single thing and they need, uh, they ask for a couple of tips and tricks from you in, in how to diversify their focus, how they can, they can add new skill sets uh, in, in their arsenal. <clears throat> uh, at the very beginning, uh, you gotta, you gotta uh, understand that making art is connected to um, to how hyped about certain things you are. So basically, um, I also hit uh, many times at that moment that I felt like I'm I'm hitting the wall. I don't have ideas, but it's 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 sorry, it's bullshit. You know, it's you you have never the moment that you cannot have ideas. You don't you you didn't um, have either enough of break because sometimes you have to take a rest or you have to take a break or you basically have to search for inspiration. Like, it's not that I'm sitting in front of my PC and it's like, yeah, I'm gonna do some castle today. You know, like you are always searching for new inspiration. And with that inspiration comes the subjects that you might use the new tools for. And basically I try to be as, as hungry, as I said before, uh, for um, researching the new topics, new, new tools, because Every time I touch upon that, I don't know, maybe if I do today like a sci-fi character, I would be so hyped about it and I would change my focus from environment to characters. I don't know, maybe it would happen, you know? So it might be related to all of you guys that, uh, that you basically have to um, dig and research your own, uh, your own interest. Because I see a lot of people, they are following, for instance, certain like online courses and they do amazing job when it comes to like uh, using the tools, but they still lack of ideas for their own designs or for their own stories, because it's more like a copycat of someone who already done that, rather than searching for some new uh, story or some new tool. Like for instance, with my Windmill Town picture, I didn't, as I said, again, I didn't know it's gonna be a big hit, but I was basically searching for some uh, marine uh, paintings, old school paintings, and I found the inspiration. Like, let's do it. You know, so this is you never know uh, when the the flow of inspiration comes and when it will push you towards a different focus. I hope that has answered the question. That's great, absolutely. And maybe maybe we can even try to open it up more because we received a lot of questions about um, sure how how do you keep the motivation in in terms of like um going through let's say uh that was a popular term in the last two days pits of despair or to, to break breaking through the imposter syndrome um how do you keep that motivation that consistency in you day in day out mm -hmm. and 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 how to break through those those walls in your in your path to be honest i feel like the motivation uh actually grew on me um, the, the longer I'm in the industry, the motivation is bigger. Of course, there are time restrictions, there are health restrictions, or basically a lot of other, you know, duties in real life, real life. We of course have uh, our families and what's not, but I feel like the motivation is higher these days for me than it was like five years ago, because when I'm already in the market and in the industry, I feel and I see a lot of new people that are growing basically like a mushrooms after the rain and they bring me so much motivation to move my ass and I always feel like I'm lazy, you know? It's crazy, but it, you, you might feel like uh, you are like a workaholic, but in the end of the day, you feel like you are lazy. <laughs> so, so like that's the thing that uh, I, I feel like I struggle the most um, um, I struggled the most before when I was entering the industry, I didn't have that much pressure, but now when you're in the industry, the pressure is really big, you know, because you're not getting younger. You're not getting, you can get better, but it goes much slower. When I'm learning right now, the new tool, 
<laughs> I feel like I'm I'm running the marathon. I'm not sprinter anymore, you know. <laughs> yeah, I absolutely know that feeling. <laughs> Um, we also received a lot of questions for the real absolute beginners, like whether whether they have studied art or not, just mm -hmm. self-taught. Um, what would be your recommendation in terms of going into the industry, making a name or meeting with new people in the industry, especially, um, well, not especially, but maybe comparing before the COVID reality when when we could travel on and actually meet people and after in, in the situation where we cannot travel like how to get that first contact first communication first networking points yeah that's a very good question because everything uh post covid change has changed and i really do hope and i have a big hope that it will finally be over but we don't know when so uh we have to uh adjust to the reality that we are living in right now. And I feel like, um, yeah, before it was very easy. You, you went to the events and you could talk to the artist. That, that, that's a hundred percent true. But these days it's more that, uh, I see some of the people like, um, I saw Levy Petterfly, uh, set up the Facebook group lately, uh, for the art critics, uh, to critique your work and to showcase your work that you can basically uh, get some uh, some feedback, which is very important because you can meet new people, but also a huge input and huge impact on today's industry, I feel has the Discord. And there are Discord mm -hmm. channels for artists. Uh, you know, we also set up the uh, Discord channel, uh, I think a couple months ago, uh, Gavriel, uh, my friend, was setting up that uh, CG uh, CG uh, a channel on on Discord. Uh, I can put the name of it later. Um, and 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 I see that this is still living. It's like a thousands of people, and it's very living because you mm -hmm. have also like an audio audio chat. You can you can basically meet people and and schedule some video calls. So this still is happening. But we have to be uh, very um, patient because I really hope that the pandemic uh, will finally be over. And then I'm definitely uh, sure that the events will come back because this is one of the best thing that you can actually meet people. Other, other than that, as I said before, you have to be brave to ask questions. Don't be afraid to... Don't be afraid to reach out to your uh, artists that you look up to. Like, if they don't answer, it's fine, you know, but there is always be gonna be someone who is gonna be helpful, you know, like, uh, so I feel like reaching out and searching for the, for the contact is one of the uh, most crucial thing, especially that we cannot met these days, you know, we cannot really met uh, in the normal conditions, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, staying within the industry, especially in the concept art area, uh, what is more popular recently in these times? Is, is it drawing or using 3D software? Because you mentioned 3D a lot also in your, in your speech, but how would you recommend, how would you uh, comment on that? Uh, just to, yeah, just to be honest, uh, 3D became like a, one of the main tools because you have to know that uh, to some degree. And these days it's, it's actually pretty easy to learn the basics of 3D, right? I'm not talking about like hardcore modeling, but to have mm -hmm. like a very uh, simple knowledge on the fundamentals of 3D. And these days Blender, everyone is using Blender. We all sort of like switch to Blender, which is pretty awesome. And it's, it's basically, it's created by the community all the time, which is, uh, which is fit with the new tutorials. and. This basically shows like a very uh, big importance of knowing that, but I'm not a specialist in 3D. Uh, I'm using 3D, but I'm still not like a, I always like using like 2D tools as well. Like I always like to sketch and, and I know that clients from the beginning, they want to see your sketches. They want to see your ideas. They want to see your designs. And 3D, of course, help uh, a lot with like uh, specific projects or certain things, or if you have, um, if you have your, uh, if you have your uh, workflow already uh, guided towards more 3D uh, designs, it's uh, it's it's like a one of the must tool to know at least 
in some fundamental knowledge, right? So it's just the big, the beginnings are very important, but if you want to push that knowledge further, it's up to you. So I feel like it's very important to still draw and sketch. We do that at school, right? We, we basically train by doing studies, uh, of course, in Photoshop, but we sketch. We, we, we have to know the line and shape coordination. And when you are able to sketch it, your knowledge on 3D will be only extra. And you will basically be able to do much more in 3D. I noticed when I know, uh, when I know how to sketch with my hands, uh, then basically going straight to 3D without a, any idea beforehand, right? So I feel it's like a very, it's like a very common uh, technique these days. But I think a mixture of 2D and 3D, the hybrid concept art is the most powerful. Yeah, um, definitely, definitely the hybrid situation and the 3D is, is we also see it in every corner of the, of the uh, creative scene right now with our users and with our ambassadors. Um, now I have a two part question, which usually comes together or hand in hand. Um, is it, I mean, we are not discarding the importance of getting an education, but not having an art education, is it a deal breaker? Is it like, if you don't have the education, you cannot do it kind of a thing. And the, the, the following question is, is there like an age which says that now you are too old to go into creative industry? Uh, I might answer the, the second one first, like, no, like I know people who were 40 or 40 plus when they were starting out and now they are one of the top industry professionals. So yeah, that's not really the case. As long as you are motivated, hardworking, hyped about what you want to do, like the age is just a number. It's like the same way that uh, you treat your body, right? You have, let's say 30 years. And maybe you can feel much better than when you were 20. I feel that that way because uh, I started caring about myself uh, maybe a little bit later, but I feel much healthier when I basically know my body these days. And it's the same with the body of work, right? That um, the the moment you start off when you are um, when you are aware of your uh, of what you want to do, what of your goals. You can start on art like yeah even later it's like there is no there is no really um golden rule for that like i know also people who are drawing from the very uh beginnings like i did and i know that they gave up so it's 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 only it's only about how much motivated and how much you really want to push that through and 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 do that for yourself or do that to make uh your career. Uh, the first mm -hmm. question, do you need a uh, art education? Mm, I mean, fine art uh, or like a university? I don't think so, to be honest. Like I have experience with that. I feel like it's five, five years, at least in Poland, that is basically put on waste. Um, maybe not totally. There are certain things like uh, drawing life model for two years, which are really awesome. But later on, the more you become, um, adult artists or grown-up artists at the school, the more you see it become like a much more like a, um, the crossroad becomes like a much more visible between what you want to do and what the school wants you to do. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me put it this way. So um, I feel like this is the times of the schools like, um, yeah, so, uh, shameless self-promotion. But for schools like Focal Point School, when we basically do very very quick because it's like six or eight weeks courses, but they are very intense, very, uh, very uh, much, a lot of information, a lot of hard work, a lot of knowledge condensed within eight weeks. And then you come back to your home and you have to digest it. And you will see that it will open your mind on many things. We already had some students who graduated from fine art school and not gonna lie to you, like they told me that um, they learned within two months more at the focal point school than they learned in in our school for five years, which is crazy because it also shows uh, the the the, um, the level of education in those like national schools, you know. Yeah, absolutely, and and uh, let's, and of, let's or, pick... sorry, sorry, and sorry, sorry for go. interrupting. Like n no one, no one ever asked me for my. Uh, 
art education paper or anything from my clients. They want they what they only see and what they really want is your knowledge seen by your uh, or visible by your portfolio basically. Great. And 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 sticking to the uh, focal point school, do you have any plans to going into online education or because I see a lot of interest in the chat about the school or do they have to come visit you find you in Poland? <laughs> Yeah, well, that's the thing. Like me and Mikko, we started that school because we we loved teaching. We did like uh, quite a few talks and and workshops in the past um, when the COVID was still not there, <laughs> and we could travel the world. So we always loved that. We also um, were best mates, and we decided like, yeah, let's run something together. We basically run it because we felt like it's a lackluster in Europe of the education. So uh, we basically wanted to create the space or the place for people uh, who want to learn because we didn't have that chance. So we want to give back to the community by providing the school that actually teaches you properly uh, how to enter and how to curate yourself in the industry uh, or how to get a job, right? So this is uh, why we set it up uh, in Poland because Mikol uh, moved to Poland. And uh, yeah, it feels like it's a nice center of Europe. So um, the connection with other countries is pretty much good. Um, not even saying that we have students from America or Australia already. So it's like show that uh, if people are hungry for the knowledge, they can come over to any country. And we basically lived by that faith and we basically stand for it all the time. We don't really wanna go that much into the online because there is so many online schools and I also run online mentorships in the past and I felt like it I miss that interaction with people you know I miss that uh, when you look at your student face and you can see you can see in their eyes if they get it or not you know with the Skype yeah you can you, you can cheat on that right so that and the, the level of motivation when there's like a 10 people in class or 12 people in class and they are gathering after the, the, the course and they sit in the coffee shop and they all paint and draw together or help each other. This is the community that we wanted to create, right? This is the community that we wanted to create for the creatives that want to basically connect with themselves. And this was also associated with one of the questions like, oh, like, um, if you are starting out and you are becoming a, you want to become a illustrator or concept artist, like how you can connect with people. like. The school is one of the things, one of the ways to do, right? Of course, right now with the COVID, we have to be very uh, strict with the rules, but it's possible to run the term. And we really put the most quality and most effort into the physical aspect of school and teaching people on, on the side because we do the lectures and we see when people are drawing in class or painting in class, we can basically come to their desk and help them. You know, that, that's something that you cannot do. Uh, for online class. So one of the most important aspects for me. Yeah, that's definitely true. We are also missing that that human touch, even though these, these online sessions and online events, um, they're helping a lot. We were also talking about this yesterday with, with Andre, uh, who is, is running this amazing THU, Trojan Horse Was a Unicorn uh, yeah, organization. Yeah. The, the 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 human touch, the human factor is definitely the biggest uh, lacking uh yeah factor the ingredients in the mix lately uh, hopefully it will it exactly will be better soon. hopefully i really hope okay. so too that the reality will come back to what it was before oh yeah yeah so i will ask you last two three questions more easier questions mm -hmm. um first of all is about portfolios um do we need different art styles for our portfolio to see our range or is it better to stick to what we are really good at or what we want to achieve with that portfolio weaving? So I feel like you can show your range of ideas and subjects by not showing your style, but but uh, by different topics, right? Different subjects. Of course, it's it's cool for experiment with your with different styles. And I do that also, but I always make sure that my brand or what I'm presenting as an artist uh, speaks for the realistic style, so so to speak. So I rather 
uh, put the focus on diversifying that uh, or making my portfolio more various uh, with a lot of variety by putting uh, a different subjects rather than the styles. But I'm not saying that the styles is not is not a bad thing because sometimes you might try a different style like a comic style and then you become like a famous with that you know then people want to hire you because of that style so it's good to experiment and see how it goes basically so give it a try mm -hmm, mm -hmm. great and then the last question you showed those amazing like trademark pieces um on average how many layers do you have in those pieces uh that's a good question uh I, I tend to flatten my pictures later on finally to make like a final post-production but uh for windmill town it was like i don't know like 300 layers or something like that so the wow. file was pretty wow. big do you, do you layer them tag them individually or you kind of just know which one is layer uh, 97 <laughs> Of course, I'm getting close very easily, so I learned to group them and and learn mm -hmm. and, and name the groups. So like, yeah, this group is for like a windmill, and this group for is for town, and this group is for like a for VFX effect VFX effect be, between those two planes, or you know this sort mm -hmm. of stuff. Yeah, yeah, grouping is key, definitely. <laughs> grouping is the key. Yeah, grouping. Yeah, yeah. definitely grouping because. Uh, I I still need to learn like uh, how to work with like a smaller amount of layers when it comes to, like a huge pieces because yeah no matter how powerful your PC is Photoshop will always have hiccups you know so <laughs> that's true that's true <laughs> yeah okay well Derek thank you so much it was it was such an amazing talk such an inspirational talk and thank you for answering all those questions I I'm afraid we didn't go through even half of them actually but unfortunately we are running out of time. So um, mm. let's 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 bring up our closing slide so that I can I can share with our audience. Yes, please don't forget to follow Derek. I'm sure you already do, but those of you who are in the audience who still hasn't done so, please go ahead and follow Derek uh, on Instagram and on Twitter with his name and surname Derek Zaprochki. Um, maybe he might answer your questions if you yeah. send them yeah. in there. Absolutely. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It was really great. Uh, thank you all for, for, for being with us here today and answering all those questions. Uh, don't forget to claim your 20% discount on Wacom Europe and UK eStore. The discount code is CAREER20. You have a week to claim your uh, special discount, so go ahead. Don't waste time. And next up, uh, in about an hour, we have Framestore Art Department with us once again, and we will have a quite a lengthy session where we will go through portfolio reviews and advice. We will have six artists that Framestore Art Department has selected out of the part, out of the portfolios that you have submitted. It's going to be an amazing session. Uh, so don't forget to tune in with that session for that session with us. Um, and yeah, that's that's all for us right now with Derek in the opening session. Thank you again. Thank you all for being with us once one last time. Thank you, Derek, so much. Thank you very much, guys. Take care and yeah, see you soon again. <laughs> <laughs>